Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Tricia. We've got this morning, our speaker is Eleanor, Eleanor Davidson, who has often comes to the travel talk on Zoom. So we are, welcome you, Eleanor, and thank you so much for, for agreeing to do a talk for us. We're really looking forward to it. Um, and also welcome to those of you who will be watching the recorded version on our YouTube channel, hopefully. So um, let's just sit back and we'll say, we'll hand over to you, Eleanor. Is that OK? Thank you for joining me on this travel talk. And I hope you'll enjoy journeying with me through time and place with a selection of my books. It's not easy to include just a handful of books from a lifetime of reading. And so it's an eclectic mix with no particular rhyme or reason. A couple of the countries portrayed in these books I have been to physically, but most I have, no, I have not and expect I never will do. But of course there's more than one way to travel. And when you're reading good writing and it holds you in thrall, during that period you're reading, you're there with the author, with the characters, the location, in that time and in that place. And whilst reading, life develops a fluidity because you're able to travel in the here and now with contemporary writing, but just as easily you're transported back 2000 years or more and to locations and situations, the like of which will never be experienced again. So here goes, a journey with my books through time and place. This was my introduction to La Belle France in this 1952 edition and the beginning of my adventures with languages. These old black and white photographs from the book of the um, banks of the Seine and a scene from the Camargue, amongst others, really fascinated me. But the photograph of Mom Marx especially enthused me, although it was to be several decades before I find myself there. Mom Marx, a place of artists and their easels in the streets, that bohemian lifestyle. I daydreamed about living there, croissants and coffee in the cafes, walking the cobbled streets, chatting in schoolgirl French with the locals, in the footsteps of maestros like Monet and Renoir, Toulouse-Lautrec. Here's an image of windmills, I understand built in 1622 originally, in the Montmartre district. By the 19th century, part of this area was owned by the Debray family, who produced bread as well as milling. Their galettes, which is a sort of crusty, pancakey bread, became popular, and galettes became the name of this windmill. The Debrays opened an area here for dancing, singing, and selling their galettes. And one of Renoir's most famous paintings is of Le Val de Moulin de la Galette, the dance at the Galette's windmill, depicting a typical Sunday afternoon scene. The painting now hangs in the Musée d'Orsay. Most deep daydreams about artists led me to getting a good telling off from my mother. I was given this tiny book, The Observer's Book of Painting and Graphic Art, and I lapped up its minute reproductions, mainly in black and white, of famous paintings. This Gainsborough is one of the few colour reproductions, and I've admired his style ever since. Well, the book informed me about the National Gallery in London, and with a friend, I played truant from grammar school and hitchhiked to London to find oh. said gallery. 
and I entered its hallowed halls. I'd memorized most of the book's paintings and I was overjoyed to find some of them in the gallery. Mother, however, was not overjoyed when, because of the hitchhiking, I arrived back home in a police car. Yeah. <laughs> my first Latin class inspired me tremendously and it lit up my small world. This reader, he was Romanus, the Roman citizen, first published in 1936, this edition from 48, revealed the comings and goings of the Roman world. Well, my first Latin class inspired me tremendously and it really lit up my small world. Civis Romanus Sum was a famous phrase used by Cicero amongst others as a plea for the legal rights of a Roman citizen. When traveling across the Roman Empire, safety was said to be guaranteed to anyone who declared Kiwis Romanus Sum, I'm a Roman citizen. By 100 BCE, the Romans had gained possession of most of the lands around the Mediterranean Sea. To govern them, they sent out men who had been consuls or praetors at Rome. One of these men, Marcus Tullius Cicero, the famous orator, statesman and writer, tried hard to uphold the principles of the Republic. It said his versatility was an example of which made the Romans great rulers. He loved the vibrancy and gossip of city life. And when in 51 BC, Cicero, though reluctant to leave Rome, is Rome here, look, and was sent to administer the region of Cilicia around here, which was then what was called the southern coast of Asia Minor. Now, it's more or less this area now in modern day Turkey. Well, Cicero kept in touch with friends and particularly with his enemies back in Rome with his many letters. He carried out the varied duties of a governor conscientiously and well. That the siege of voyage he made to and from Cilicia was perhaps behind one of the observations he liked to quote. <clears throat> there are three types of men, the living, the dead, and those who go to sea. And I think anyone who's been at sea in rough weather, even if only for a short time, would be inclined to agree with him. Cicero would have been well aware of the famous pirates of Cilicia. On the southern coast of Asia Minor lay precipitous headlands backed by rugged mountains, perfect hideout for pirates. They made their headquarters in a town called Caracasium, located on a rock that dropped to sheer 600 feet to the sea, connected to the mainland only by narrow isthmus. Of course, archaeologists discovered a monument set up in the second half of the third century BCE by the people of Amorgos, a small island on the south Aegean. Translated, it reads like this. Pirates came into our land at night and carried off young girls and women and other souls, slave and free, in all over 30 in number. They cut loose the boats in our harbour and seizing Darius's boat, escaped on it with their captives and whatever else they'd taken. By the early part of the first century BCE, the pirates of Cilicia controlled the seas. On one occasion, they captured Julius Caesar, when as a young man, he was sailing from Rome to Rhodes to study law. The pirates put an enormous ransom of 20 talents on his head, but Caesar complained and told them to up the price as he was worth at least 50 talents. Whilst held by the pirates, 
Caesar treated them as his personal slaves and demanded the best of food and conditions. He'd practice his oratory on them and gave them a dressing down when they failed to appreciate his style and performance. He warned them that he'd hunt them down and hang them once the ransom had been paid. The pirates had enjoyed having him with them, but and they were, let's say, more than surprised when he kept his promise. Um, apparently, he decided to be nice to them and slit their throats before crucifying them. Here are a few examples, fairly quickly, from antiquity of Roman seagoing vessels, taken from Lionel Casson's excellent books about seamanship in the ancient world. They're well worth a read. It's astonishing to hear about the scope of those seagoing craft. Well, here I am now in the polar world in the early to late 19th century. This book was first published in 1881 and translated into English in this 1884 edition by Robert Routledge. It's an important publication because much of what is described is lost forever. I journeyed with the author through the Arctic region, in his words, to the eternal snows and largest glaciers in the world, to a land frozen to its depths and shrouded during the greater part of the year under a thick sheet of snow. It bears no forests and yields no harvest. Men manage, however, to live in these desolate regions. They remain in the condition of tribes, without industries, without arts, in summer camping out under tents, in winter hiding in underground lairs, incessantly wandering in pursuit of prey. Through the Arctic region, in his words, to the eternal snows and largest glaciers in the world, to a land frozen to its depths and shrouded during the greater part of the year under a thick coat of snow. <laughs> It bears no forests and yields no harvests. Men manage, however, to live in these desolate regions. They remain in the condition of tribes without industries, without arts, in summer camping out under tents, in winter hiding in underground lairs, incessantly wandering in pursuit of prey. <clears throat> It's not easy to encompass this book in a few minutes, so I've chosen a few paragraphs to, to read to you in the author's words. Lieutenant Bello described in his journal a visit. By the way, his, um, these are obviously not Eskimo, these are the um, expedition group. It says here there, snow in places up to our waist, although quite a few of them, they're up to their necks in snow, aren't they? Anyway, I'm quoting from the book. Lieutenant Bellow described in his book, um, a visit to, to uh, an Eskimo family. He said the opening was scarcely two feet high, covered by a skin. As he drew nearer, warm and fetid exhalations met him. He entered, having crept along for six feet, in a kind of drain with damp walls, his feet plunging in a soft mud of water, blood, oil and grease. There was on each side of the entrance a kind of bench raised a little from the ground and covered with skins. This served at once as a bed and a table. In the middle, in a space about three feet square, lay half of a seal. You can see them dragging one here, look. A mass of trampled over bleeding flesh 
from which the inhabitants of the hut could draw their supply when they wished to eat by merely reaching out their hands. In 1854, in Smith's Sound, at the point of Rensselaer, he was wearied with a long and toys toilsome journey of 18 miles and benumbed by a strong icy wind. Several Eskimo, by shouts and gestures, invited him to take shelter in their snow burrow. He followed them by creeping through a subterranean passage 30 feet long. He said, I breathe the ammoniacal vapor from 14 bedfellows, strong, full fed, dirty, and undressed. It's impossible to imagine without having seen it, such an irregularly piled up mass of human creatures, men, women, and children, with nothing to cover them but their native dirt, intertangled and wriggling like worms in a fisherman's basket. He was put in the place of honour, having next to him on one side the feet of the mistress of the house, and on the other side a child, whilst under his head for a pillow was the warm, plump stomach of his host. He declares he slept till the next morning without once waking. You can see um, the summer tents here made of animal skins and the dogs looks like with the bone remains they've been having a feast. And this head here, it looks like another drawing in the book of, um, of a polar bear actually. The kayak, I'm quoting again from the book, the kayak's made of seal skins and stretched on a light framework of bone. These skins, dried and rendered impervious, are sewn with sinews of the walrus and are so well pieced together that not a drop of water can pass through the joints. The top of the boat is covered. In the middle, there's a round hole in which the Eskimo stations himself and fastens himself in by lacing the edge of his garment round the circumference so as to form part of the boat. To see them joined together, one has to consider whether it's the man that's become canoe or the canoe which has become man. He launches forth on the waves without keel or ballast and ventures on currents and eddies raging among the rocks often far distant from land, sometimes he's capsized. This is um, quite a sort of hungry looking polar bear. He looks quite bony. And you can see the explorer's sailing ship here. And it's also got auxiliary steam engine. On the sea, they pursue the seal, the walrus and the narwhal. The barbed point of the harpoon penetrates to a depth of several inches into the flesh, but the handle is immediately detached and drawn in by means of a strap, whilst another thong about five fathoms in length remains to connect the harpoon with a leathern bag made of the skin of a sea calf and inflated with air. This bag serves as a buoy for, in preventing the animal being lost beneath the waters and marks the course he's followed. On the ice field, where seals and walruses are assembled in herds, the Eskimo is able to approach without alarming them by creeping on his belly and imitating their gait, attitudes, movements and cries. When he's near enough, he rises suddenly and attacks with his lance. So you can see that here. So, leaving the Arctic, still in the 19th century, going to 
a little bit warmer climbs, at least for part of the time. With Two Years Before the Mast by Richard Henry Darner. Eighteen forty, this was published. Here's a photograph of Richard Henry Darner when he was an older man, not a young man. He was born in eighteen fifteen, came from a high profile family in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was studying at U Harvard University, but abandoned it because of eye problems and decided to ship as an ordinary seaman on board a trading vessel the brig Pilgrim. He was bound for California from Boston here, down here, Brazil, look, and down Cape Horn and up to California. He was away for over two years. He actually journeyed back on a different ship, the Alert, simply because it left sooner to get back to Boston. The term before the mast refers to the quarters of the common sailors in the forecastle, in the front of the ship. When you're reading, you note Dana's sympathies with the working class, and he later became a prominent anti-slavery activist. To give you the perils I faced whilst at sea with Dana, Here's an incident related by him. This was a black day in our calendar. At seven o'clock in the morning, we were aroused from a sound sleep by the cry of all hands ahoy, a man overboard. Hurrying on deck, we found the vessel hove flat aback with all her studding sails set. The watch on deck were luring away the quarter boat, and I got on deck just in time to heave myself into her as she was leaving the side. But it was not until out on the wide Pacific in our little boat that I knew we'd lost George Bulmer, a young English sailor who was prized by the officers as an active and willing seaman and by the crew as a lively, hearty fellow and a good shipmate. He was going aloft to fit a strap round the main topmast head for ringtail halyards and had about his neck the strap and block, a coil of halyards and a marlin spike. He fell from the starboard futtock shrouds and not knowing how to swim and with all those things around his neck, he probably sank immediately. It'd be, he, he wouldn't have got to the platform. By then he would have been climbing upside down along this shroud here. And he would have fallen from a great height into the sea. We pulled a stern in the direction in which he fell. And though we knew there was no hope of saving him, yet no one wished to speak of returning. And we rode about for nearly an hour without the hope of doing anything, but unwilling to acknowledge to ourselves that we must give him up. At length, we turned the boat's head and made back to the vessel. Death is at all times solemn, but never so much so as at sea. When a man falls overboard at sea, and is lost. There's a sad suddenness in the event and a difficulty in realizing it. You miss a man so much. A dozen men are shut up together in a little bark on the wide sea and for months and months see no forms and hear no voices but their own. And one is taken suddenly from them and they miss him at every turn. The effect of it remains upon the crew for some time, as more kindness shown by the officers to the crew and by the crew to one another. There's more quietness and seriousness. The officers are more watchful and the crew go more carefully aloft. 
the lost man is seldom mentioned other than, well, poor George is gone. His cruise is up soon. He knew his work and he did his duty. He was a good shipmate. So this is a replica of the brig he sailed on, the Pilgrim, um, at Dana Point in California. Um, but last March 2020, um, apparently the ship began to heel to starboard in its dock. And very sadly, the decision was made to demolish it. Seems a great shame. Right, now we're going to the heat of Angola with this Cinquenta Poetas Africanos, 50 African poets. It was published in 86. Um, we're going to look very briefly at a little bit of something about Angola. It's an anthology of 50 poems, obviously, covering a period of 100 years, more or less, to the 1980s, from the five African countries which were previously under Portuguese control, Angola, Mozambique, Santa Mé and Principe, Cape Verde, and Guinea-Bissau. Many of these poems are calls for independence, and they demonstrate the powerful and world-changing possibilities of the written word. Many of the poets, for example, Agostino Neto here, is his image in the corner here. Uh, many of them were politically active. In Neto's case, he became a future and first president of Angola. He went over from Angola to study medicine in Portugal and Coimbra and Lisbon. And as with many politically active writers, he was imprisoned on various occasions. He was the president of the MPLA, the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola. And he became the first president, as we've said, of the Republic of Angola. His poetry and that of many of his contemporaries was heard all over the free world and supported by, by many. This is one of Neto's poems. Avemos de voltar, we'll return. It means we'll return, but in the sense that we'll take our own country back, we'll be independent. And briefly, he's, he's talking about our lands, our fields, our coffee plantations, our diamonds, gold and copper, our oil, our rivers, lakes, and forests, our traditions, our carnival. We will return, or we will have it all back. Our beautiful Angola, our land, our motherland, will return <coughs> to our liberated and independent Angola, which, as you probably know, happened in the 1970s. Now, I think we've got a few minutes to go on to the next book. Four minutes to go, Eleanor. Okay. Shall I start this or would you prefer me to stop and take any questions? As, as you feel, do you feel you need, now you come to this point, is it best to stop there, do you think? Um, I think we might do this one really in a few minutes. All right, go ahead. That's great. So this is Capitais Daurea, which means Captains of the Sand. And it was written by this man here, Jorge Amado, a Brazilian. Because of his, he, well, he wrote to expose in the form of the novel the injustices faced by the poor and vulnerable. 
because of his political views, he was arrested in 1935, and his books were publicly burned by the Brazilian dictatorship, and they were banned at the time in Portugal. He later went into exile, returned to his homeland in 1954. The novels were set in the hot, drought-ridden, poverty-stricken interior of early 20th century Northeast Brazil. It's this area in red he mostly writes about. Um, here's Brazil. Here's, here's the area again. This, this area of Brazil. The original book was published in 1937, the captains of the sand are children, mostly boys, hiding from the authorities who might, if they catch them, put, the into, put them into the infamous children's home in the city. Everyone's heard of the abusive life carried on there. We meet the condition of those children in the home later in the book. Amado writes this novel to decry the real life situation of the very many abandoned, orphaned, and outcast children in the region, left alone to cope and steal to survive. So we join the gangs of children who shelter each night in an abandoned warehouse near the beach. They organize themselves and arrange a hierarchy choosing their leader who allots their various duties and we live their precarious lives and deaths with them. Amado includes some famous real life figures of the late 19th, early 20th century Northeast Brazil. The fierce cangaceros, bandits on the run from the law, men who reject working as slaves on the plantations and are unable to find any work. They hide out in the dense matter of spiny vegetation, difficult for outsiders to penetrate. They raid the farms of the big house, big houses of the plantations with food and money. Thank you. Um, so there we were, or what, there I was at least, in the, um, in the heat of uh, northeast Brazil, very early in the 20th century, with the author Jorge Amado, the Brazilian, and his book Capitais da Areia, Captains of the Sand. And <laughs> we were just going to have a look at, at this man. He's a real life um, man, Miguelino of Herrera da Silva, better known as Lampião. Lampião is, uh, means oil lamp. He was called oil lamp because he was so quick off the draw that he illuminated his surroundings. But old and young in the book led a very tough existence. And they had to take tough decisions to stay alive each and every day. I think I was mentioning that some of those abandoned children did um, join the Kangaseros, the bandits, when they got that little bit older and, uh, and lived the life of an outlaw, hunted down mercilessly by uh, the authorities. But in his books, Amado takes us to the world in, in that northeast region of Candomblé, an Afro-Brazilian religion developed in, in Brazil in the early 19th century by African slaves. And their Orishas, their deified ancestors. And he, Amado also takes us to the traveling fairs and storytellers um, that 
that, uh, I mean, that was the only way the storytelling with these traveling storytellers that people got to know any news that was going on, really. It really was a, it was a, a very impoverished life they were leading. And Georges Amado's writing is, is tender. It's really compassionate. It's quite lyrical. And this one, The Captains of the Sand, is probably the most famous of his many books. I don't know, it's quite a mystery why he wasn't awarded a Nobel literature. Yeah, and basically, he wrote because his anger, because of his anger at the situation of exploited people. And it is palpable. Uh, Georges Amado, here he is again, he died in 2001. And one of the obituaries from a Portuguese newspaper began, Adeus, Capital da Areia. Farewell, Captain of the Sand. Well, we're going to stay in the heat. And this time we're actually right in the 20th century. This book, O Anjo Branco, um, in English, The White Angel. And that's him here, the white angel, um, was published in 2010. And its author, José Rodríguez Santos, is an, an academic, a writer, obviously a journalist. He, um, he fronts um, Portuguese television news. He has done since 1991. And he's based this novel on true events in Mozambique during the last decade or so of Portugal's rule there. Of course, many Portuguese were employed in African Portuguese colonies, and many were conscripted to fight in those countries until independence was won in the 1970s. The hero in the story is based on this man, Dr. Paj, uh, Dr. Page. Um, he was a true life medical doctor. It says here, o medico voador, the flying doctor. Um, and this is um, Jose, the author's father. Um, the real Dr. Page and, and the doctor in the book, um, he grew up in Penafiel in Portugal and was at university in Portugal uh, studying medicine and he specialized in tropical medicine and then applied to work in Mozambique hospital in the main city down here, look, in Lorenzo Marques, which is now known, well, since independence, known as Maputo. Um, so this, this here, at the top here, is the symbol of the uh, Mozambique flying doctor service. Um, so here he was, down here in Lorenzo Marques, starting um, his, his service as a doctor there. This doctor always wore white safari clothes because of the heat, and also because he saw white as a symbol of peace and humanity. He dropped from the sky in his tiny aeroplane and the people came to know him as the White Angel. The doctor and his wife, who was a pharmacist, um, were friendly with the country's first and only at that time black lawyer. And they were astonished when the PED, that's Portugal's feared secret police, outlaw and capture this friend who's fighting for Mozambique's independence. The doctor and his wife are punished by Portugal's colonial administration for remaining friendly with the man by sending him to work from here, right up here to Tete. Here's a, here's a larger map of the Tete region in Mozambique. Apparently it was known as the White Man Cemetery this area. The temperature was 50 degrees in the shade, known as Deep East Africa, one of the hottest locations in Africa. 
the doctor and his wife are appalled when they're up there and frustrated to find that medical services and sanitary conditions are almost non-existent, as were the roads. So he's driving out every week to isolate his settlements to help the afflicted, but finds it difficult if he ever needs to get people, and he often needs to get people back to Tete itself in the hospital. So he has the idea to create the Servicio Medico Aéreo, the Flying Doctor Service, and he fights really hard to be granted a small aeroplane for the very occasional use. Um, this turns out, though, to be so successful that soon he's flying daily over vast amounts of territory in a tiny aeroplane to help bring health uh, to isolated provinces. And he's able to deal effectively with diseases then, such as leprosy and malaria, and to carry out mass vaccinations. But Mozambique's fight for independence is hotting up. And the doctors faced with the situation of saving the lives of both Portuguese troops and native insurgents, the latter of which does not sit well with the PED. Remember the Portugal's um, feared secret police. Eventually, the doctors put under house arrest for treating indigenous civilians and militants but he refuses to betray his ideals or those of his Hippocratic oath. We enter into a surprisingly graphic description of the horrors perpetrated during the War of Independence in Mozambique, including the massacre, some of you may remember having heard of it, in 1972, the massacre of the civilian population at Wiriyamu in Tete district by the Portuguese army and by the PED. It's an important novel, a superb way of bringing atrocities to light, describing racism and apartheid, of the dedication and altruism of individuals like the doctor. And so these photos I'm going to show you now are from the blog, the blog of the um, author's family. So we're looking at the real life doctor um, here and his two sons quite some years ago. And this is a, a photograph inside one of the airplanes. Look with the doctor, patient here, and a couple of nurses. Um, there's a medical team standing by the, the airplane. And um, here's the author again here, Jose and his brother. And um, they are at the opening ceremony, um, a street in uh, Penafiel, where their father originated in Portugal, uh, is being named for their father. So that's rather a nice, rather a nice picture. And very nice family, <laughs> I understand. So. so still in the heat, but maybe this time it's a bit more temperate. The house of Bernarda Alba, La Casa de Bernarda Alba, takes us to the heat of southern Spain in the early 20th century and the suffocating situation of women in the then social order. Its author, Federico García Lorca, was born in 1898, and this famous three-act tragedy of his was completed in 1936, just two months before his brutal murder by Francisco Franco's people, early in the Spanish Civil War. Lorca's body, like many others from that period, has never been located, but probably lies in the countryside just beyond the city of Granada in Andalusia, Lorca's hometown. Um, here's uh, the house where Lorca was born in Fuente Vaqueros. It's not that far out, so it's in Granada province. And this is the family home, was the family home in Granada itself. 
La uh, the House of Bernarda, Bernarda Amber, was first performed in 1945 in Buenos Aires, nine years after Lorca's death. The lead actress here, Margarita Shigu, the lead actress and director in the production, Margarita was a friend of Lorca's. She had fled to Latin America in exile from the Franco regime. And her involvement ensured Lorca's ideas on its staging were met. His Lorca and Margarita. I imagine that's not long before his execution. Lorca subtitled the play, A Drama of Women in the Village of Andalusia. Bernarda Alba is a recently widowed domineering matriarch and lives with her five unmarried daughters, her elderly mother, and the housekeeper. A house of women, at the beginning of the traditional eight-year period of very strict mourning. The only acknowledgement of the outside world during this time, this whole eight years, is a shaft of light through the window. No men appear in the play, but we know that Pepe, Pepe and Romano, a handsome young man from the village, is never far away. We hear the tantalizing horse sound of his horse neighing. The eldest daughter and heiress, Angustias, that's the name, by the way, of the patron saint of Granada, Angustias, is betrothed to Pepe. But we learn that, unbeknown at that time to Bernarda, the youngest daughter, Adela, and Pepe had been engaging in a secret affair. Bernarda is scandalized when she discovers Angustias one day putting a little makeup on her face. And when Adela puts on a green frock, Bernarda knows that something must be done to counteract all this passion. It ends in tragedy. Adela hangs herself when she hears that Pepe has been shot dead. Bernarda returns to the house with her shotgun and admits she's a poor shot. Pepe has in fact fled the village on his horse. Lorca is a feminist, one of the 20th century's great writers. He used to take his plays round to be enacted in isolated villages so that the ordinary people could enjoy art and some enlightenment in their lives. And this wor work of Lorca's, La Casa de Bernard Alba, has been played all over the world ever since and has been set in various scenarios. Here's a production a few years ago at the Almeida Theatre in London. It was set in Iran and it worked brilliantly. So now to Portugal. Here's the author here, that's a little sort of image of him. Essa de Courage wrote O Crime do Padre Amaro, The Crime of Father Amaro. The author himself was born in 1845. And I was very fortunate to study for a while at his old university at Coimbra. That's it here. He was a, a fine novelist, eulogized on his death by literary giants like Emil Zola. With the um, crime of Father Amaro, Essa de Carage, the people call him Essa, they know him as Essa. He scandalized the Roman Catholic Church on its publication in 1874. In Mexico, 2002, a film based on the novel caused controversy on the part of the Roman Catholic Church who tried to stop its release in, in Mexico, but they failed and it became Mexico's biggest box office hit. But back to the novel and the murky world of keeping up appearances in 19th century Portugal. The novel is set in Leria, 
here, just here. Uh, Portugal, when a new young priest takes up position following the death of the previous incumbent. Everybody keeps an eye on everybody else, on the lookout for any perceived lowering of morals. But the priest is, at least at the beginning, a model of devotion and duty, although he actually lacks a vocation for the priesthood and is sexually frustrated. Amaro falls for a young girl, Amelia. She's the daughter of his landlady. And she is the mistress of Amaro's, Father Amaro's superior, the Canon Diaz. Well, human passion and nature take their course and Amelia ends up pregnant. The father, prom the father Amaro promises he'll take care of her but he's primarily concerned that no one should discover his shameful secret. Father Amaro and his maid find a wet nurse, nurse, sorry, find a wet nurse who it is implied has no compunction in killing babies in order to put things right. Amelia gives birth to a boy. She dies alone. The word is put around that both she and the boy, the healthy boy, died of complications. The priest moves on to a new parish and to greater things. Essa was himself, was, as well as a writer, was a top grade civil servant. And his employment uh, in the Portuguese consular service took him, to, took him to work around the world. He was born here just above Porto, Povo de Vazim. He worked in Porto, in Coimbra, Évora, Lisbon, Leria, where the novel was set. Then he was sent from Leria to La Habana in Cuba. And then came to work in Newcastle in England and then Bristol. And then down to Paris, which is where he died in uh, 1900 and this is a memorial <coughs> excuse me this is a memorial to the author in his hometown of Povoa de Vazim you see this stack of books here it's rather a nice monument oh off to China with this folk arts of new China. Um, this was published in 1954. So we're traveling now to the land, to, to the China of Chairman Mao, who I'm sure you know, was a Chinese communist revolutionary who was the founding father of the People's Republic of China. In the 1954 introduction to the book, Jack Chen informs us that the articles, in his words, the articles give revealing glimpses into the way folk arts have emerged into the broad stream of cultural life in Mao Zedong's China. They show the transformations that are taking place in the old arts under the impact of the country's new life. You've got a few, the writing's very small here, isn't it? But it's entitled Dances of the People. You've got Tibetan dancers here, Shi people here, the long drum dance of the Yao people. There's two Uyghur people dancing there, and Li people here. This one's a Mongolian dance. So this journey took me to Chairman Mao's era. Uh, and I'm going to quote again from the editor, Chen. The first chapter is about the waist drum. I'm afraid I haven't got a photo of that. So Chen says, as the people's armies advanced from the countryside to liberate the cities, they took with them the militant, courageous, exciting beats of the waste drums. 
in the first May Day demonstration after the liberation, under brilliant sunshine and amid flying red flags, 2,000 waste drum players and symbolists headed the parade into Tiananmen Square. Then we've got a chapter on shadow theatre. And this is rather a nice illustration of a shadow play figure. And Chen says again, I'm quoting him, a square of white cloth stretched between four sticks of bamboo, two of them stuck upright in the earth, five feet apart, gay embroidered curtains framing the screen, and black curtains on either side hiding players and musicians, a large trunk of props, a lantern to throw the shadows and the screen. <coughs> this is the equipment of the shadow theatre. Sorry. I've only got one vocal cord and sometimes it gets a bit awkward. <coughs> so this is the equipment of the shadow theatre. Children squat in front of, on the ground. Oldsters bring their wooden benches. Young people perch on nearby trees. Night falls. The bright lantern throws the dancing shadows on the screen. Then we hear about the New Year pictures. And this here is a New Year picture. And quoting again. Um, the New Year pictures, the earliest one still in existence, dates from the 13th century but dates long before that. They were pictures or icons supposed to guard the house from evil and renew each new year. The ancient classics portray them as door gods. By Mao's time, they represented harvests and agricultural equipment and so on. This particular one portrays one of New China's most popular heroines, this young girl here as she meets Chairman Mao. She risked her life to save her colleagues and factory from a threatened explosion and suffered serious injuries to her hand. And you can see here, can, can you see? I hope you can. Her hand is bandaged or it's in a white glove. So there she is. Her name's at the bottom, but I can't see it on my screen now. Um, Here's another of those New Year pictures. It's entitled Chairman Mao Talks with the Peasants. It's quite interesting to, to look around and imagine where they are. You see the baskets down here. There's some smoke. Something's being cooked over here. Looks like the windows of a barn in a way. Looks like there's hay and reeds stacked here and so on. And this next one um, shows a picture of peasants signing the um, Stockholm Peace Appeal. This is another New Year picture. Again, it's really interesting to, we've got the, I think they look like mallards in the sky there and the hens down here and the various bits of farm equipment. And the girl look here on top of the haystack. It's, um, it's very interesting. Um, Chen then talks about the egg books. He says they're called so because they're cheap as eggs and you'll find them in almost every peasant's household. <clears throat> in the old days at festivals and fairs, booksellers did a brisk trade in these slim booklets, a wonderland for the price of an egg. But in 1950, they found themselves, they found them as cheap as before, but how different with their vivid drawings. Um, this is, uh, I think this one's called the Red Silk Dance. And there's another Red Silk Dance going on here. And this is a paper cut this one, and I think we've got another paper cut here. 
Um, and Chen says that the paper cuts were displayed in windows, bright splashes of colour by day, at night turning the frames into silhouette screens. Some are knife cuts, some scissor cuts. And then he goes on to tell us about, um, I mean, this, this is a scene from a film in Chairman Miles' time. Uh, this is an opera. Um, I think this is a local sort of amateur dramatic, not that amateur, but local drama. Um, he tells us about various plays from real life situations. And he tells us about one entitled, The River of Ice Has Thawed. It's a play written and acted by the former prostitutes of Peking, in which they told how they'd been freed and returned to a normal, healthy life. They portray the oppression of the Kuomintang, denouncement as communists, the workers and prostitutes revolt is helped by real life communist underground. Faced with solid working class unity, they cannot be broken. So there's a lot more about the folk arts. It's, it's, and, and the images are, are really quite special. Um, but we can't show it all here. And in fact, I see we're nearly up to time. And so the next book would have been this one, Como Il Atravesse Africa, How I Crossed Africa by Serpa Pinto. And there isn't time to talk about this. And there are several more books to talk about really, but I'll just give you a quick flick through this one. It's another really special one. It takes us to various parts of Africa there's the author look, charming, charming looking young man. Um, and he, as, as well as writing articulately and profusely, he, um, he did all these um, pen and ink drawings, which I'd like to go through one day with you. They, they're fantastic, they really are. But alas, Time flies, as Cicero probably would have said, who we met right at the beginning of the talk. And so I shall go right to the end now and say that if anybody wishes to make a donation um, uh, by way of travel talks, um, could I ask that you'd perhaps think about supporting Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. They're hoping to raise money to save two wildflower meadows. So um, we'll return to the present 21st century. And uh, well, we've not got the, uh, the cold of the Arctic nor the heat of Angola. We're back where we are, but I hope you've enjoyed um, these travels with my books through place and time.